Is, uh, is Brad around? Oh, we called him. He's on his way. Is everything okay? Yes. Uh, I should see him before he sees the baby. Okay. okay. As soon as he gets here? Oh, is there anything wrong with the baby? Oh, nothing. He's beautiful. Is he? Is he? Yes. He's black. <gasps> Right, if loving you is wrong fans this is my first cast member interview with one of the amazingly talented cast members of the of the show that many feel was cut too soon deborah stipe aka dr rastin is here and we're going to talk about things in regards to her journey in acting what it was like working with tyler perry at tyler perry studios as well as the phenomenal cast of if loving you is wrong some of the funny moments on set some of the favorite moments on set and everything else in between now i know everybody and their mother wants to know the answer to the burning question who is the baby daddy we're, we're going to talk about it but keep in mind there's so many other things to talk about in this interview so before going any further Make sure you give this video a thumbs up to show you like it. It really does help with the YouTube algorithm. Go ahead and hit subscribe if you are new. If BET Plus can hit a million subscribers, so can we. Because unlike BET Plus, subscribing to the channel is absolutely free. Also, links to my social media, they're in the description below. And also hit the bell icon, that way you stay notified whenever I post new content to the channel. And also, I will put links to Deborah's social media in the top comment below. Make sure you show her some love by following her on Instagram and Facebook. Now, without further ado, I'll show one more quick clip from If Loving You Is Wrong. We'll go right into the interview, and I hope you enjoy. Are you, uh, you Dr. Reston? Yes. I guess there's really no uh, easy way to say this, except to just kind of come out and say it. Um, are you the bitch that switched the DNA results for my son? I beg your pardon? Okay, I don't know what you've heard or who you've spoken to, but I would never do anything that unethical or underhanded, okay? Yep. You need to check your sources and you need to find your way out of this house. Okay. All right, if loving you is wrong, fans, the day you've been waiting for has come upon us. I have the wonderfully talented Deborah Stipe here to answer your burning questions about the good doctor. Did, 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 did she switch the DNA results? Uh, who's the baby daddy? What made, you know, what became of... Alex and Brad and Marcy. Well, we'll get to that a little later in the interview. Uh, before that, we need to talk about the incredible acting history of Miss Stipe. Now, without further ado, let's jump into that first question. What inspired you to pursue acting? It is so great to be here, I just gotta say first. And thank you for all your work and all you do. And how you keep all the details of all these different shows straight is amazing, is amazing. But let's jump to it because the doctor is in the house, right? Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. Um, I actually grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in a suburb of Chicago and I'm one of seven kids. And so our household was just like super creative. Um, we were always like sort of putting on shows and I was usually the ringleader. And so if there was a holiday, there were uh, neighbors uh, at the house, we would put on, that was our favorite form of play was putting on shows, at least it was mine. <laughs> and I would basically draft my brothers and sisters uh, to do shows with me. But I ended up doing a lot of theater in high school. And then I went on to college and was a theater major as well as a voice major nice. at Northwestern University outside of Chicago. So I just, it was just something that I loved. It was just sort of in me. Nobody was uh, holding anything to me to, uh, to do this. This, this was just uh, my, own, my own flame. That's great. I, that actually makes sense now that you mentioned how you were kind of like the ringleader in the home with your other siblings, and right. now you have a studio. So I think that's pretty cool. It is kind of cool. It is yeah. kind of cool. It's, I, a lot of, I, I, I love kind of seeing kids that innately have that fire in them, because that's the true test. I think so many of us show our true colors, even at a young age. Oh, yes, that's true. So, it's fun. Okay, that's great. Well, that leads into the next question, and you know how impressed I was when I saw this. What were some of your early acting projects? And ladies and gentlemen, the resume is extensive. So oh. just to give you a quick look into that, I was blown away with how many times I've unknowingly seen this talented actress without knowing oh. it was her. Oh, 
Wow, that's fun. That's cool. Um, honestly, I did a lot of theater, like I said, in Chicago. Um, and while I was in, living in Chicago, I got an agent and I got what they call your SAG card. I booked a National McDonald's commercial, which was sort of like my first little break. And then I decided I need to spread my wings. And so I moved to Los Angeles. And uh, my first job there was a series called The A-Team. That's right. The A-Team. I was the uh, universal tour guide on the A-Team. I remember meeting Mr. T thinking, this is awesome. <laughs> I have arrived. Um, but then I just went on to book uh, regularly. I worked on um, LA Law, a show called Moonlighting with Bruce Willis. I had uh, a number of episodes of, uh, with Angela Lansbury and Murder, She Wrote, which was a blast. Um, I did some movies of the week. Uh, I did a movie called Gladiators with Brian Dennehy. Uh, not Russell Crowe, but it was, it was a very nice film. It was really the beginning of Cuba Gooding's career, and he was phenomenal. Um, but then I did uh, a number of episodes of Full House. I played a Cindy. Yes, I did. Um, played Bob Saget's girlfriend for a while. And then I did a show called In the Heat of the Night, uh, which was funny, ironically enough. We shot it in Los Angeles, but the show obviously filmed right here in Atlanta, which is now where I live. So funny. So there was one episode where they had to fly me to Atlanta to film it. And my in-laws had moved here. And I remember we, we sort of did some looking around while I filmed that episode. And crazy enough, we ended up living here. But I shot all of, most of all of uh, In the Heat of the Night in Los Angeles. So that was, that was a thrill, working with Carol O'Connor. Good stuff. And you yeah, played I, uh, I, Pat Day, no, correct? What was that? It was uh, Pat Day, correct? Yes, Pat Day. Okay. I was the private investigator. Nice. Cause I was scrolling as you were listing off your resume. I'm like, yep, there it is right there. Cindy. Yep. Okay. And right. I mean, there, there were other shows like I vaguely remember like Blossom and Head of the Class and Who's yeah. the Boss. Who's the Boss, right? My sister still reminds me. My sister's a huge Tony Danza fan. And the fact that I did not bring her home a Tony Danza autographed photograph, she will still to this day, not let me forget it, but... Tony, if you're out there, if you can get me an autographed copy of your face, my sister would be so happy. I mean, can you blame her? I don't think so. But here's right? another question for you. Out of all the shows you've been on, which one do you think that you felt that you, I feel like every actor I've talked with so far, whether it be a Zoom interview or just, you know, on Instagram, every role kind of teaches them something differently about themselves. Like what was your most challenging role and which role do you feel like was the most rewarding because it allowed you to show a side of yourself that you normally don't show in your everyday life? Mm -hmm. I got to play Marilyn Monroe once in a project. Mm -hmm. It was for BBC. Mm -hmm. We rehearsed in London then we shot it in Glasgow, Scotland. So the whole experience was amazing to be overseas. But to play a woman that actually lived and tragically died was um, exhilarating, sort of humbling, right? And having to do the research on who she was. What I loved about the project, it was not the sort of public Marilyn Monroe, it was the private Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. So that was really, really fun because it was, uh, it was challenging getting in somebody else's skin and having to prepare. Um, and we rehearsed it for two weeks. So it was like doing a play. We became a very close cast. It was an all female cast, female directed. So we would have tea every afternoon after we rehearsed. So the whole experience was really lovely. That's yeah, amazing. so that would be one of my favorites. Yeah. Nice. Okay, oh, and then Matt Locke. I love that. I love right? that show. Yeah, right? I mean, Remember and all these shows had right? classic theme songs too, I mean. <laughs> I mean, you can't sing Full House without getting that tune in your head, so. Right, right. I mean, I remember growing up watching TV shows, I will be mad if I missed the theme song. Like, I mean, that just set the mood for the entire episode. Right? Theme songs are important. Oh, yeah. It's amazing, like, how many people can sing Gilligan's Island or Full House. It's crazy. Yeah, and even the songs about the uh, lyrics to them, you know, that instrumental, and once that beat comes on, boom, you, you got to get started. You got to get started. But the <laughs> next question, okay, folks, I know you're I know you're burning inside to ask the Dr. Raskin. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting but there. We're we'll get there. We talked about your acting journey so far, so let's move on. It's good old Tyler Perry Studios. What was it like working with the man himself? 
I'll tell you what, his set is unlike no other set. And there's a couple reasons to that. One is when he arrives on set, he has everybody pray, which is amazing. That was the first set that's ever happened. He wanted everybody to be united and he wanted God's grace to be upon him. So I loved him for that. He has an incredibly diverse team and I love him for that. I don't know that people fully appreciate what he has done. Because friends come to work, people are going to work and they are working together. And whether you believe in all of his projects, I do believe that generally he's trying to communicate a message in what he's creating, but also he's created a huge message in the fact that he's bringing people together and creating so much opportunity for people. So I just have to say that. But I also will say that there is not a director out there that works as quickly is Tyler Perry, I gotta say. Now, I was not fully prepared for that, okay? Um, so now, once you sort of understand how he works, it's, I personally think it's kind of a dream because he works incredibly quickly. But he has, he has lots of cameras going at one time and you might work part way into the scene and he might say, pause, and he'll bring in the cameras tighter and you will just pick it up from right where you were. He's also like, he just, he wants to get a lot done quickly. And again, I just kind of love him for that. Um, you might shoot 50 pages in a day with Tyler Perry, which is unheard of. Um, so you just got to know your stuff. But he also, I just love that he respect, respects actors and he allows us to kind of like play. And he asks the cameras almost to follow the actors. And it's a, it's a joy. But if you're, if you're not prepared for it, um, it can throw you. <laughs> oh, I believe that. Oh, yeah. I also would say, too, you know, he is director, writer, producer. He's, he's kind of a one-man show. So that has its pluses, too, honestly, because, he's, because he is calling all the shots. Um, he can make decisions. He's not having to sort of wait and check in. Um, he's, if he wants to change it up, let's go. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. Nice, because basically he creates, a family too. he creates very much a family atmosphere. He has a lot of fun. first. The first uh, scene I shot was a little stressful in the sense that it was, you know, it was my first time working for him, um, and it started to rain outside. And so, what was going to be shot like three hours later that day, suddenly we had to sort of adjust the schedule, and everybody had to come in from the rain, and we're shooting a totally different scene. So uh, my hair was acting up. And um, he was not very happy about that. Um, we just like stall for my hair or something. Um, but, but down the road, he just became more and more comfortable. And again, it was just a family. It was uh, a thrill. That's yeah, I, I really think that if Loving You is wrong, it was a unique cast. Uh, these folks had worked together for years. And there was a unique energy amongst those folks. Uh, a very special group of people. That's amazing. Yeah, and Tyler was, at, Tyler was at the helm. Everyone was incredibly grateful for the opportunity that he was providing for them. Because yeah. I know um, the fact he does, he's, he's basically, you know, writer for all, all the different hats he wears. The right. thing about it is, based off what you're saying, and, and other people I've interviewed as well, it's like his vision is what comes out, but at the same time, he allows for the actors to kind of do different things with the characters in certain moments. Like I've heard stories of how there are ad libs that get at it sometimes, or sometimes, like you said, he'll stop it and throw in a line, like feed you a line and based off how it's delivered, it will make it into the final cut. Right, right. It's exciting to work with. I, one of my favorite scenes was we're around that conference table. And we're meeting with the, uh, the head of the uh, hospital and my license is on the line. Yeah. And I've got the French twist because I'm trying to be very taken. I'm trying to be taken seriously that day. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't want to lose my job or my license. And nobody knew that El Tony, that Randall was going to jump across that table. <laughs> nobody knew, but that was the beauty. Tyler loved it. He let Randall play and he did. And so, I mean, that startled response from all of us was uh, pretty authentic. I got to say. That reminds me of watching Martin back in the day because I love like looking at shows from back in that time, you know, before I had the whole theory mindset 
I love learning about ad-libbed scenes or scenes that caught the other actors off by surprise, like when a character <laughs> will just lose their mind and everyone's reaction is 100% legitimate, like they did not <laughs> see it coming. And oh, oh, yeah, that's right. That's when Randall and Larry came in there. And yes. then Larry, it was the subtle one, is like, you know, um, I know this hospital's reputation well, and I don't think they would forge any kind of documents like this. These papers right. are legit. And then Randall just acted a fool. That was something else. I remember that. That was one. wild. I loved it. I loved it. Okay. How, how Randall can be, how Tony can be such a nice guy and play Randall. It just, it bewilders us all. You just never know what you're going to get from that character. One minute it's like, you know, he's semi-level headed. And right. then he's like a, you know, a snarky character. And then he'll just take it to the next level of, okay, dial it back. But it's like, you can't tell him to dial it back because he's going to dial it up even more and turn the whole scene out. And that leads into the next question where you just mentioned one of the standout scenes. What were some other of your favorite moments as the good doctor in the series? You know, I loved working with both of these actresses. Um, I loved working with Alex, Amanda Clayton. I felt like sort of a bit of a mother figure to her. I get that. I you know, yeah. um, I, I think that if Dr. Rawson has any downfall, it's that maybe sometimes she cares a little too much beyond what she is legally allowed to do. Um, so she pulled some strings a little bit. Um, she made sure, I remember there was a scene where she made sure that she was able to nurse her baby um, because Alex was kind of on the line. So anyways, Amanda was a dream to work with just a solid actress and such a genuine human being. Um, and then Heather was so much fun too. I mean, Heather can, can turn it on. I mean, the sort of depth, the well, which she sort of acts out of is, is deep. And of course, Aiden Turner. I mean, again, British gentleman. And yet you never know quite what to expect with Brad either, do we? No. I'm yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, the finale is just flashing in my mind. So I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But was there any actor slash character on the show that the doctor wasn't able to interact with that you wish you could have had a scene with? I mean, Eddie. Like, that would have been wild, right? Eddie is terrifying. Um, and again, Joel Rush, one of the nicest guys. But um, Eddie's terrifying. I'm not even exactly sure what an interaction would look like between Eddie and Dr. Roston. I could see Eddie somewhat being like Randall. Like I remember the scene where it was revealed, like the, like the doctor found out that Alex had lied about the DNA test. And I know that Randall came up to her acting all polite, but then he just started calling her out of her name and everything. He's like, you know, I want to sue this hospital. And then oh, yes. I, I could see it kind of being like that, where he'll just come up to the doctor and ask a question. And then if the doctor gave answers that he didn't want, he would go into full Eddie mode and then leave. I could possibly see something like that happening. Yes, I could too. I could yeah. too. And, and imagine if there, and again, not to jump too far ahead, but if there was a season six, and Eddie's in the hospital for the shoot of the gunshot wounds, right. and then the doctor's <laughs> tending to him. Or something, right? well, well, there we go. The, the, there's the scene right there. Maybe. He's in the hospital. Maybe. The doctor comes in. Boom. Ooh, I like it. There we go. I All like right. It. So this is it. The major question, because uh, for everybody watching, I put a poll up on the community tab a few days ago saying, hey, we're going to have the doctor here for an interview. What are some of the questions that you might have? And we have over 10 different comments. Unfortunately, they're all pretty much saying the same thing in between DNA results, is Tyler bringing the show back? So we're just going to ask the question that I already asked in the pre-interview questions, but doctor, could you tell the good people, did you or did you not switch the DNA test results of Alex's baby? Deep breath. To the best of my knowledge, I did not switch the DNA test results. Okay. There was a time, I have to say, as an actor, 
there was a time I wasn't sure. And I pulled Tyler aside and I said, did I switch the DNA? Because as an actor, I, I need to know, I want to know. And even him, he, he just kind of put his hands up. He didn't answer the question. But as I continue to sort of, I know, right? But as I continue to follow along with his writing uh, and just, you know, playing what the material he gave me, um, no, I don't think that she did. I think she was genuinely surprised by this Ian character. And um, no, I don't think so. Ian? Okay, well, folks, that that's the answer. I, 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 I don't... wish it was something more scintillating for you, friends, but we'll just. I think what's tricky is I do think that Dr. Rostin does. Again, I think she has a tendency to care too much, and so there was a time I thought this could be interesting that she did do this, which would have been a big deal, which she would like definitely have lost her license for. Um, but I, because I didn't know that Alex had. A little bit of a pass, shall we say. Because there was that scene where you came over to the house right. and you had the folder and you showed Alex. He's like, are you sure that Randall and Brad were your only partners? And then Alex was like, uh, yes. And we're like, you lying. So I was, we were always thinking, oh, so does the doctor know that it's not Randall, that it's not Brad? There could be a new player on the field. And then Ian who was already an established character in the show, kind of like, ooh, is he going to get with Marcy? Oh, all of a sudden, oh, um, Jennifer Peppa. We had a one, you know, a one night stand, and I'm like, what? And then Larry, I don't know if you watched this episode from the final season, but it was when Brad found um, Alex's dating profile, and he saw like 20 different names, and Larry was the name of one of those individuals. And then we find out when she was talking with Ian that Ian's like, and, and I forget the ranking people, you can let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. Ian is like her number three in terms of like the top men she's been with. And Ian is way above Randall, but then there's the number one guy who we got together once. He was like so amazing. He would do all these things. And then ironically enough, Larry was the name of one of the individuals who showed up on her dating website in the chats. And then we also learned that, well, we knew this a couple seasons ago, but Larry was into like, um, I don't know the technical term, but bondage and chains and whips and everything. So that kind of made fans think that that Larry from the show could possibly be the baby daddy, but he's allegedly dead in the final episode. So. So no daddy. <laughs> yeah. So, but but who do you think? I feel like this, just, uh, folks. I'm asking the question in an opinionated fashion. So remember, nothing we say here is the gospel. Tyler Perry is the only person who can reveal who the daddy is, who did. Okay. But in your opinion, in your professional opinion as a doctor, who do you think the da baby daddy is? And again, this is her thoughts, not confirmed confirmation. Okay. Thoughts. Exactly. Not confirmation. Okay. In my professional opinion, I'd like to think it's Ian. I don't like to think it's Ian, but I do think it probably is Ian. It's not Randall. No. No, it's not Randall. And it can't be Brad. Um, apparently there are like scientific obscurities that do, can, that do happen, but uh, no. So I would, I'm going to guess Ian. Ian? Too bad. He's probably dead, though. I know. That's a shame. I know. So where do we go from there? I think we need at least an, a wrap-up episode. Tyler Perry, one more. One more. It could be wrap like up a... Wrap-up don't you think? Yeah, it could be like a couple hours long. I mean, it doesn't even have to be like an If Loving You Is Wrong movie. I know some people uh, keep talking about, bring it back for like three more seats. We don't need that. We just need um, a... Closure. A Closure. Closure. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, these are my speculations, friends. I mean, I would love to hear from the man himself, the creator of the show, who is the official father of Alex's baby. There we go. And also a quick segue into the next question. Speaking of closure, you know, what 
do you think became of your character or what would you want to happen to the doctor if there was a final season or a, a, a true final episode? What would you want the future of your character to be? I think she's got a big heart. And I think what's, what's so troubling, you know, how many episodes was she asking Brad to see a counselor? How many episodes was she asking, you know, trying to be there for Alex? Um, so they, they officially did get divorced. But you think about this. Alex now has been convicted of murder. Talk about messy, right? So, I mean, I'm seeing her probably visiting the prison. Yes, I can see that too. See if she can be there for Alex. See if, again, it's, it's not her place, but I think there's something in her that wants to sort of unravel this mess. Um, and even, like, I know she probably reached out to Brad. Think about the think about the the turmoil in Brad's soul, soul. The mother of his children he put in prison, basically. So he's got to wrestle with that. So I don't know. I think there's something. I would hope that there's something about her uh, sort of integrity that uh, brings a little bit of a sense of conviction. Um, I want her to always feel like a safe place. Um, with, with these characters. Um, but so I think that life doesn't really get easier for Dr. Rawson. I think she is willing to sort of step in the middle in the mud and um, probably meets with Brad and probably goes and sees Alex to see what she can do. Her husband is a judge. Oh, I, don't know if I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah. So I've always wondered, hmm, does she have little late night conversations with her husband um, where in her empathy, she wants to see if she can help, which I think is where, you know, she has her own sort of personal little struggle. Yeah. Is that helpful? <laughs> that, that, actually, that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, I always thought that based on the finale, I hated the character assassination of Brad where yeah. he goes from, it's like, Marcy, I, I was never really behind the Brad and Marcy relationship, personally. Like, I didn't dislike them as characters, but I felt like them hooking up a couple times, oh, obviously a knee-jerk reaction exactly. to Randall and Alex. Yeah, it's retaliation. But, and it's plus, they always kept having this whole back and forth of Brad wanting to escalate the relationship. Like, hey, let's get married right away. I'm like, and then Marcy rightfully was like, look, we both just got divorces. Let's not rush into anything right now. And then she wasn't afraid of flashing the ring to Randall to make him jealous. And then that led to him doing what he did to her, just scooping her up in the middle of the night, dragging her to his home. Now, you know, what happened to him, I'm not surprised because to be fair, you we, with Randall, you don't know how far he was going to take it. Like, for all we know, Marcy could have been killed. So what got me was the fact that she killed Randall, but instead of calling the police. Now, I don't really know the legal ins and outs of this in terms of, you know, premeditated versus overkill. But she literally was in a situation where she could have been killed herself. So why would you shift the blame to Alex? Right. right. Obviously had nothing to do with this. I mean, is that why Ian was killed? Because Ian... And technically, Stephen, too, saw that she was not wearing that blue dress. They saw that she was on drugs. I think Lu Lucian even saw that. So I feel like there are so many characters who could debunk the Alex being in jail right. thing. So right. It, it could have no been self-defense. It could have been self-defense. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I feel like it would hurt Marcy more than Brad. The reason why is because uh, it reminds me of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart. It's like, you know, the guy that murdered the old man and then he felt guilty. So he just kept hearing the heartbeats and everything under the floorboards. Yes. I feel like um, with Marcy, and, I, and we talked about this uh, before the interview, when it came to Peter and Paisley, it's one of those situations where how right. can you look into the eyes of those children knowing that your actions put their mother behind bars. I think it would eat Marcy alive on the inside. Brad will be the one trying to help her cope, but she will let the guilt get to her. And I think what would be great is, yes. is El Tony, correct? That's the name of yes. Randall's actor. Yes. Uh -huh. What Tyler Perry could do, because it could show with Randall dead, he's still not gone. 
like his presence still resonates. Like, for example, he could be haunting Marcy. Yes, in her dreams. Exactly. Like, seriously, nightmares. Exactly. Like every time she tried, every let's say Brad is trying to, every time Brad is trying to reassure Marcy that you did what you had to do, it's fine. Have him like appear in the corner or something like that. I mean, you could also do the same with Eddie and uh, Esperanza if he's d actually dead. Because right. there are so many examples in have and have nots, like where dead characters, fans are like, why not have this person come back for a flashback? Why not have this person haunt somebody else? That would be great. Yes. No, they're iconic characters. We're sort of glad that they died, but we still want to see them. So I think yeah. that's great. I know a lot of fans say the same about if loving you is wrong and the haves and the have nots. There are like titular evil characters who they want dead, but they also say, well, they're the reason I watch the show. But I always tell myself, and again, Tyler Perry does his thing, you know, so that's a whole nother level. But sometimes I'm wondering how much of, how much it would show him as a writer of, let's say, he had the guts to kill off, let's say, Eddie or Randall, but they're not really gone. Like they're dead, but their presence is still felt. So even with them gone, most people would think, oh, life is easier, but really it's not because you got to think about how their actions alive impacted those who are still alive. Like I said before, Randall haunting Marcy, that would make her, go that was his thing. Being a psychiatrist, he was able to get in people's minds. What worse way to get into the mind of someone than to haunt them? You totally. push them to kill you. And then that might actually put her in the loony bin. <laughs> Which wouldn't be, yeah, all surprising. Yeah. And I, I like think, it. I think it'd, it'd be cool. Oh, thanks. And then the whole Alex thing, her in jail could help her sober up and realize her reckless lifestyle isn't what needs to be done. She'll realize that she needs her kids that I'm not saying her and Brad will get back together, but at the same time, they could probably reconcile in some way. But I don't really know how, I don't know what's worse, cheating on your husband with hundreds of men versus accusing your spouse of murder they didn't commit. That, that's right. a tough one. Right. And plus, we can't forget though, like how loony Alex's parents were. Let us yeah. not forget. And we tend to be, you know, it's hard to be numb to the environments we grew up in. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, that was some rough stuff. I know. That's when the show, like, I was like, whoa, I didn't know Tyler was going to go there with it. Uh, Seriously. Uh, Rusty in Virginia, right? I think so. Yeah. Like, hardcore redneck. Ugly. Yeah. And then the fact that, you know, we learned about Alex's past, like how she pretty much put on a new persona when right. she met Brad, when she went to college. And it was just amazing to see the different layers of Alex. And I mean, I mm -hmm. always get black because I would say Alex was probably like my favorite character. And people huh. were like, what in the world? I can't help it. It's like every time it, there's a Tyler Perry huh. show, there's that one character I gravitate towards. They kind of remind me of somebody I know in real life. Mm, yeah. yeah. You had kind of a strange, even though she was messed up, you always had sort of an empathy for her. Yeah, it was well, kind of a crush, well, but well, yeah, well, that, that too, that too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, actually, there's one comment I wanted to read. Okay, it's from J. Lan Hallen Burton. I probably messed up your name, but you got a shout out. He says, <laughs> I'm so happy that Dr. Rastin was not put into any compromising situations because I love her character. She is huh. one of the few characters who didn't fall under any temptations throughout the entire series. How nice. Yeah. And I would say that, well, not any scandalous temptations, but as you said, sometimes she cares a bit too much. But at the same time, at least your character didn't have a lot of dirt on her. But fans, I know the only dirt was the whole DNA test. But again, she did not switch them. Unless Tyler writes season six and says that she does. <laughs> we'll always sort of leave that little window of possibility open, I guess, right? Yeah. But I mean, there's so many things that could happen with the future of if loving you is wrong, possibly bring the show back on Viacom somehow, a BET Plus, Netflix. <laughs> I, I mean... You just never know. And I think that when it comes down to it, I, I feel like, not to sound entitled, but I feel like we deserve it. We need, we deserve that true conclusion, not just for the fans, but to the cast, because they became those characters. I mean, I would feel a bit slighted if my character didn't get the full story arc that they deserved, or right. maybe not complete arc, but at the very least a conclusion, because I was saying, 
will we get an epilogue? Will we get an extended finale? No. Nope. Right. Well, no, I think what's funny, Jeremy, is like, again, you get tons of messages. I get tons of messages. People asking me, will there be a season six? Do you switch the DNA? I'll be in the store and people will recognize me as Dr. Rawson and beg me to tell them, did I switch the DNA? So people want to know. And the last episode, I think, was, was like so many cliffhangers, which, what, which is what makes another great episode. Mm. So I'm all for one more. You know, there's a series called Longmire. And Longmire ended, and people were so sad about it. Like, the people literally petitioned. And so they decided to rally and give us another episode because we needed to know who Longmire was going to end up with. You know, these are important questions. So I do think there's an, I guess what I'm saying is, I do think there's an audience for it. You know, because there were so many things we're still wanting to know. So if there was even one more closure of an episode, I think there's an audience for it. So. That's my two cents. Oh, no doubt about that. I mean, look at Greenleaf. When they announced Greenleaf, the final season, people lost their minds. So much <laughs> so, the following week, your prayers have been answered. The spinoff is in the works. Because right? they knew they had to jump on that bandwagon. Because people were just, when I tell you people were mad, I was like, come on now. What can I do? Well, people so, get so invested, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. that show, five seasons, give or take four or five years. Same thing with Loving You Was Wrong. Uh, when did that show start? 2014, I believe? Yeah, 2014. Yeah. and not okay. to it's a, good, it's a sign of a good show when people care that much. That's exactly, yeah. you know, the creator, that's exactly what you want is people caring, right? Oh, yeah. But I also yeah. think another reason fans were so mad were – the show started to take these incredibly long hiatuses, like a year long. And it's like, uh -huh. when is it coming back? So I honestly, I never even thought about that until just now. I think that's what added even more fuel to the fire of what kind of finale was that? There are like 15 storylines and characters we never even saw in the finale. There were so many characters missing from the finale. It wasn't even funny. Hmm. I mean, Eddie went to the, Eddie was just going around allegedly killing people from what was it? Ian, Larry, he punched his wife and knocked her out. Then uh, he finds out Mika's dead because of his own actions, but blames on Esperanza. And then Esperanza, well, shoots him to death. And then the episode opens up with Marcy and Randall's dead body. But then I'm like, well, this is Tyler Perry. Randall could probably still be alive. No, nope, he's dead. So. <laughs> I mean, there's brain matter everywhere, but again, this is Tyler Perry land, so I don't know. There are just so right. many ways it could go down. But that's the shit. But, but speaking of shows that kind of ended, also I wanted to bring this up. I know Fuller House came on Netflix for a number of seasons. I I, I don't know mm -hmm. the exact number. I remember I watched about halfway through season one. Yeah. Okay. If if you were given the opportunity to come back, I know this question is kind of out there, but I know that Vicky apparently came back to see Danny. I don't know. I think they probably got together or not. I don't know. I, I watched a bunch of compilation clips, not the episodes. Would you have wanted Cindy to come back? Well, here's a little inside story, Jeremy. So when I lived in LA, I'm doing Full House, done three episodes. I'm engaged to my real life husband. And they wanted me to become a series regular. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to marry Bob Saget on the show. <laughs> and uh i was excited and uh my agents actually talked me out of it um and i understand why um they felt like creatively there was probably more sort of challenging work out there for me i'd done some feature films and i think they thought this is you know there's a lot of leads on that show already you could get lost you know in retrospect do i wish i had taken it yeah probably you know it's uh, you know, when you become a regular on a show like that, it really sort of sets you up oh, yeah. for, you know, more projects where you can kind of call more of the shots. Um, but so anyways, uh, I would have, I would have married him on the show. I think that would have been fun. So I think it would have been fun to bring Cindy back. Absolutely. Man. But, right? I mean, I mean, it that... might have been fun to have a little bit of like a tussle between Vicky and Cindy. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. kind of fighting for the man yeah 
I mean, I'm just thinking about how that show syndicated, how often it's on television when you flip it on. So that that's wild. That's wild. But I also think that, let's see, I don't think Dr. Your, your character even had a scene with like, well, I could be wrong, Lucian and Natalie. I don't think so. Well, no, I think she did briefly after the baby was born because yeah, yeah, she was in the scene with all the ladies. She was in the scene with all the ladies. Exactly. It we're we're literally trying to prepare these girls. They're all excited to see the baby. And I'll never forget them walking over to that window. I'll never forget it. That scene. Oh yeah, that's right. Because you had something like, I need to speak with Brad. Can you tell us there's something wrong? No, no, I just need to speak with Brad. Oh exactly. man, he was furious. And your memory's like a steel trap. Good for you. Thanks. And yeah. I mean, that was during a time where I wasn't watching the show religiously, but there were some key moments that really stuck out. And yes. I mean, that just turned the show on its head because when you think about it, it's like Alex was, there were a lot of main characters, but I feel like the Alex storyline was like the main one to an extent because it really branched off to Brad, then Randall, then the affair, you know, Marcy's mad, mad about that. And then the whole ladies, what I liked about the first few episodes is like, it really established that sisterhood, even Definitely. though some of the uh, women were new to the group. Right. So that brought about an interesting dynamic. And oh, yeah, I love the way he crafted those, those women. It was such a, a great chemistry between those gals. Love those ladies. Oh yeah. Cause I think I've watched the first four episodes in the past month. I was doing like a little rewatch um, review series and I was thinking, wow. It, it's crazy to see how the, the characters started out to where they ended up at, in episode 102 when it ended because that finale, it's like there were just so many story beats from season one that I really wish we got that that period at the end of like did Lucian and Natalie get married? Like did they end up moving away? And then with the whole Kelly situation, she's out of jail now. What's going to happen between her, Justice, and... Uh, Wow, I, I feel dumb because I forgot the father's name. I did too. Man. But I know you're people get on me sometimes about the memory. Like, guys, I review like half a dozen shows. Sometimes the names escape right? me. So. But hey, it'll come to me later. I'm impressed. You're doing a great job. Oh, thanks. Seriously. But uh, um, another question for you, you know, in the midst of the pandemic and everything going on, are there any current projects you're working on at the moment or anything that you've already worked on before the pandemic hit that fans could possibly see you in in the near future? You know, it's funny. Somebody recently told me, um, you have lots of levels. And I said, levels, what exactly does that mean? I think she was really just saying lots of different interests and you have your hands in lots of different things. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I guess, I guess she's right about that. Um, so I run a studio with my daughter and we have a team of instructors. It's called Stipe Studio. So we train young actors. We train actors of all ages, but are primarily we work with, with, with students. Um, so we created actually an original comedy series out of the studio. It's called Life at Stipe. Life at Stipe, because that's what it is. The kids like to call the studio Stipe. And so they teach, we teach acting, we teach singing, we do musicals sometimes, uh, we help kids get agents. Um, the kids are auditioning for, you know, Stranger Things, big projects. We had one of our students do Young Dylan. Um, mm. We had a blast. Uh, so we love what we do, but so we created a comedy series out of the studio. We shot four episodes. We were halfway through episode four and COVID hit. <laughs> so we still have these four and a half episodes. Um, so we're actually kind of, you know, sharing it with some key people to see if there's some interest. Uh, we'd love to pick it up again when the time is right. So Life at Stipe, you can be looking for that. Um, and Stipe Studio, you can follow Stipe Studio. But I also uh, run some Airbnbs with my husband. We have seven properties in North Georgia. So we have uh, two tree houses, which people love. And then we have um, houses. So I help him run that. Uh, so that's sort of another project that I definitely am working on. Um, and then auditions are, auditions are picking up again. So I'm up for, you know, just some things even in the last couple of weeks I'm waiting to hear back on. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also, um, I think that we're seeing in this pandemic so much creativity happening. Um, you know, you've been doing this for a while. Um, but I've even toyed with kind of creating something, not, not the same as what you're doing, but I like to call it uh, the Sofa Series. 
And I'd love to have on people where I interview them because I, I'm the natural question asker. I mean, I'll answer your questions, but I really love, I love getting to know people and I have just some interesting people in my sphere. So whether it's some of our students that have done well, or it's different actors that I've worked with or women that I find really inspiring. Um, I've toyed with kind of creating a little kind of interview show. Uh, I would enjoy that. So that's something I'm throwing around. That's great. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's just like this Zoom interview series. I, people have been asking me for well over a year to do these kind of things. But for me, it was like I wanted to, one, hit 100,000 subscribers first. And okay. then, two, kind of evolve into the next step. And you're absolutely right. In the midst of the pandemic, it's really, I feel like if nothing else, it's aside from creativity, it's forcing people to focus on one thing instead of being scattered. Like you could be working on multiple things, but you have to, in a time like this, think about what's the one thing that you feel is going to work. And then that will lead to the other things happening. So I, I actually like the idea. It reminds me of uh, Oprah's Masterclass. I really love that series too, oh, where, where she has it. people and interviews them. I think that was on the own okay. network around the time it first started. So there were a lot of great interviews on there. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Yeah. I appreciate the encouragement. It could be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, I've never been inside of a treehouse, but I look into the photos you post. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. Well, I'll tell you what, Jeremy. We need to have you come out. We need to have you come out because these places are pretty cool. People, I think, are craving getting out of the city a little bit. I think they feel safer out where they've got a little more quiet, a little more land. There's a lot of wineries nearby, so you can sit outside, have a glass of wine. So, yeah, we need to have you come out. Our team, our building team, we call them the Treehouse Squad. Uh, we've got uh, four guys that work with us, and they create these beautiful places. Um, what's kind of funny, though, is we name every one of our properties. So our last treehouse, we named it Daybreak. We had a name competition on Instagram, so people could submit their name ideas. So this one gal submitted this name, Daybreak, and I was like, I like that. It speaks to a sense of like hope. And we all need sort of fresh inspiration, right? Because we're in this COVID oh, yeah. world. So then I see that Tyler Perry has got this article out on the cover of People Magazine. This is face. And in his article, he also has an Instagram video about it. But he talks about his mother, Maxine. And she would always say to him, Tyler, look for the signs of daybreak. Look for the signs of hope, for the signs of change. And be, be a voice, be a leader in showing people that daybreak is coming, you know? So when I read that article, I was like, it was like such affirmation to me that yes, we're gonna name this thing Daybreak because the guys, the treehouse squad would come to the job site to work on the treehouse every morning and the sun would come up behind Walker Mountain because that's the view. And so it was just like Daybreak, which is like the perfect name. So I really do pray and hope that, that the treehouse is a place where people can come and feel refreshed and feel a sense of hope and, and daybreak. But um, again, confirmation for Tyler Perry. Thank you, Tyler. Can't argue with that, especially when you're in the same location as Tyler Perry Studios of all places. Right? It's crazy. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, uh, did you go to the uh, gala opening last year? I did not. Yeah. Okay. But I heard so many amazingly inspiring things about it. I love the whole thing, that, that, that he was just valuing his actors, his creators, his, the people that have inspired him. Awesome. Yeah. You know, he's, I mean, your audience probably knows this, but he named the sound stages after, you know, Denzel Washington and Oprah and Cicely Tyson. I mean, amazing. And then so many of the actors, even if you're loving you as wrong actors, getting their stars on the, on the, on the boardwalk there. Love it. Love it. You know, it's the main building there at Tyler Perry Studios. It's called the Dream Building. Yes. I mean, that makes you kind of want to go to work in the morning. You show up, and that's the first thing you see. It's awesome. Yeah, I was upset because I know that they had talks of this year being the year they would start officially allowing tours and everything. And I said I would save money and somehow, some way, get down there. But then, well, the pandemic hit, and that kind of ruined it. But oh well. So, right. Yeah, right. I, I, the, the, the stars are my favorite part of that gala. Just like, right. because what was, was it? There? Oh, what was that? I was there? You there? No. Oh, okay, well, I thought maybe you were there interviewing people or something, you know. 
people ask me, I'm like, no, nah, I'm uh, my channel was big at the time, but I'm not, I'm not like that yeah. yet. So who knows? Give it time, Jeremy. Give it time. Oh yeah. But uh, I remember he got his star on the Walk of Fame like a couple of days before the opening. And what I loved hearing the stories and reading the captions were, I thought my time, I got inspired seeing Tyler getting his star. And then in a way I felt like, man, maybe my time is up. I didn't get one. But then he gave us one at the Oprah Sound Studio um, like area. So to see what was it? Have and have nots, if loving you is wrong, love thy neighbor, house of pain, for better or worse, meet the Browns. And, you know, obviously as time goes on, he'll probably add shows like uh, Sisters and the Oval and Ruthless and Bruh. So I think that's just incredible that even if your show is over, your part in the Tyler Perry studio history books is there for people to see. So that's just amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, what he's doing is so inspiring. He just won the Governor's Award, apparently. Yes. 2020. Amazing. I mean, he just keeps going and going from the... I mean, I remember he's talked about in interviews how he doesn't care about the recognition from, like, the Oscars or Hollywood, but here he is winning the Governor's Award, which I read, I believe, is, like, even higher than our Emmy. So it's one of those situations where he's in his lane, he has his audience, and the thing I always tell people is, Mm-hmm. even if there's one particular project you don't like, if I feel like he has something for everyone. Mm-hmm. I yeah. agree. I agree. Got- he has a very different feel than If Loving You Is Wrong, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, <laughs> you got the darker shows like Ruthless. You have shows that tackle, well, I mean, that's shows for the young people like Young Dylan. And with the Viacom, that's one thing he kept talking about how it allowed, it was like a bigger playground than um, the the own network. And with his new studios, he's able to pump out material even faster than before. So I always say, like, there's no telling what he already has done, but it's kind of in the, in the vault, so to speak, because his recent movies like uh, Nobody's Fool, Medea Family Funeral, he talks about how he filmed those a couple of years ago and he's been shelving them. So there's no telling what he has left in store. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. He's got a great team behind him, great resources. And I mean, the fact that he filmed Sisters in the middle of this pandemic, you know, talk about ingenuity, right? Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, I, I tell people watching a lot of the cast of, because it was Sister Season 2, The Oval, He's doing Ruthless right now, and he's gearing up for Bruh season two because a lot of the cast are down there now. And I tell people, I can't wait to review those seasons. And, yeah, I want to review it like I usually do, but at the same time, I just uh, – just an even higher level of respect because not only is he allowing people to get back to work because people got mouths to feed, bills to pay, but he's going the extra step to make sure everybody's as safe as possible. And not a lot of people do that. Oh, I know. No, there's, he's got a very creative video they, they made of, of showing kind of the inside peek of what yes. it looks like, right? Getting tested every day. and uh, Camp quarantine. Yeah, that's what they call camp it. Quarantine. Exactly. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it looks like they're eating well, movies on the lawn and everything. So that that's just phenomenal. Yeah, that's but it's a lot phenomenal. of work, a lot of extra work. And expensive, too. People were telling me, like, how much. I mean, uh, I know this one person. uh it was one of the sisters cast members. He did like a 20 minute YouTube video. It didn't reveal spoilers, but it was just like the camp quarantine experience, like from the testing, from the travel to going to set. And he's like, look, I I know Tyler probably doesn't want me to say the amount, but I forgot the amount, but it was, it was really up there because it cost a lot to make sure people, I mean, we're talking people getting tested dang near almost every day, like five, 10 tests. So it's expensive, but at the end of the day, it's amazing that he's able to do that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And also, when you uh, think about it... Ready, people are ready to get back, so... No. And you think of how fast he films, it's almost like Tyler Perry has so many different projects to release while other people are still trying to open up. So it's a right. time where his uh, fast-paced filming is actually an asset. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, that actually does it for all the questions, but... Were there any last minute things you wanted to add on? And of course, folks, I will leave links to all of Deborah's social media in the top comment below. So you make sure you give her a follow, show her some love. And, you know, let, let, let's calm down on the DNA test questions. I feel like we got the answer we can get for now. Maybe Tyler Perry for now. Will, will give us something else. But was there anything else you want to add on? 
Gosh, I just appreciate everybody's love. I mean, I think that's one of the things I love most about doing If Love and You Is Wrong is the fans are so loyal. Uh, and so I always love running into fans and I, and I don't mind the question. So thank you for the love and thank you, Jeremy, for, again, for what you're doing. Oh, no problem at all. And who knows, maybe if there's a hashtag, if loving you is wrong, season six, if loving you is wrong, who the baby daddy? Maybe we'll get those final episodes you want. And I'm just saying, now I don't know for sure, folks. Don't quote me on this. It's just a thought. With Tyler filming so many things so quickly, maybe he'll think about if loving you is wrong. Keep, I will say this. <laughs> he said he was done with Medea. But after seeing how many fans came out to the farewell play, and oh, oh, and that's right. On Thursday, the Medea farewell play is coming to BET+. Plus. He's done a few little promo videos on his social media about it. He's like, you know what? I thought I was done with that old bird, but seeing how many people came out to see it, I mean, with the noise that people have been making about if loving you was wrong, right. Right. who's to say we couldn't <laughs> get the fun finale? You know, something about this theme, Jeremy, I did a movie called Father Figures. Mm -hmm. It was originally called Bastards. I played Terry Bradshaw, the football player. I played his wife. And the movie is all about Ed Helms and Owen Wilson play brothers and they're trying to figure out who their daddy is. That's what the whole movie's about. So this whole theme seems to be just following me around. <laughs> and that actually, I mean, well, you went from daybreak in the magazine to daybreak to uh, the treehouse. Now you got right. baby daddy drama on one show. Baby daddy drama, following me everywhere. That seems to be a big thing in a lot of his shows actually in regards to like uh, who's the father or of this potential baby. But I just wanted to see, was there anything else I had to add to that? Well, Alex was having sex a lot in the past several episodes before it ended. So it was like, well, is she knocked up again? Well, Do she was willing to leave her kids. Leave her kids? Leave her. That's the part that got me. I feel like. Uh, yeah. They just assassinated the Alex character. I mean, the tagline of the final season was. Who is Alex? We never really found out. She was mainly drunk. I, oh, and that's another thing. I wanted to find out how the doctor would have reacted to seeing Alex the way she was at the end of the series. Because at that point, she had been drugged up. She had been drinking so much. Sex with everybody. So, I mean, I can't even imagine what her reaction would have been to seeing Alex in that state. Right. I mean, I think like a big sister or like a big sister. Get her home, sober her up. Show her some love, and let's try to, like, unmask all of what's going on with your little heart, girl. Yeah. I mean, right? there are so many masks on. It's just hard to tell which one is the real Alex. But that's the one thing I will admit. We did see a lot of range from Amanda in that final season, though. Yeah. I do appreciate yep. that. No, I mean, good for Amanda Clayton because it was a challenging role. Oh, I believe that. Oh, yeah. I believe that. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on. And, uh, guys... Mm -hmm. Just, again, show her some love on social media. But uh, let me know who the next interview should be. You know, I'm working um, with some other people in the near future. I can't wait for that. But uh, thanks so much for tuning in. I do appreciate you coming on through. And take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Jeremy. I can't lose this baby. I'm four weeks past where I've ever gotten before with a pregnancy. I can't lose this baby right okay, now. Okay, I need you to calm down, okay? I'm trying. Okay, no, no, no. You don't understand, okay? If you keep thinking about all those things, it's only going to upset you more, okay? Uh, so I need you to think about good things. Is there someone I can call for yeah, you? Yeah, call Brad. Brad? Yes, Brad Montgomery. Alex's husband? All right. Once again, thanks so much to Deborah for coming aboard for this interview. It was definitely a blast. When, see, the thing I love most about the cast interviews, they, they are things that aren't recorded. Uh, typically, you know, we have like a pre-interview discussion and then we talk after, you know, the recording has stopped. And my goodness, uh, we, we could have went on for a while talking about it. But I feel like if nothing else, the biggest takeaway from the conversation is that, guys, as much as as the love and support is appreciated when it comes to reviving if you will if loving you is wrong you really need to direct your focus to tyler perry tyler perry studios and the well i don't even know if i should say the own network because i know uh, most people are under the 
you know, uh, speculation that, hey, you know what, if we want the finale for If Loving You Is Wrong, the real finale, the finale we deserve for our characters, we need to have it. Uh, most people are saying like BET, BET Plus. My attitude is like I said in the If you've been on the channel long enough, it isn't what I just said in the interview. I said this in plenty of videos and posts. We don't need a final season per se. And if we do get a final season, we don't even need like 20 episodes. We just need a handful. If not, just give us an extended episode and be done with it. Just to know where the characters are at, you know, in the future. How do things get resolved? So tweet Tyler Perry online. I feel like Twitter is probably the best thing to do. Um, hashtag, I don't know, if Loving You is Wrong Season 6 or Bring Back If Loving You is Wrong. I mean, look, he brought back House of Pain. Um, you know, Have and Have Nots uh, was supposed to end at Season 7, but we're getting a Season 8. And the list goes on. I mean, there are just so many things that are going on right now that I'm sure Tyler Perry wouldn't mind whipping together and if loving you is wrong conclusion my guess is if this were to happen I could see it happening probably once he's kind of caught up on everything in regards to filming that COVID had slowed down so I feel like uh, once he's finished working on his current projects which I believe is wrapping up filming for Ruthless moving into filming Bruh season two I believe there are a couple of movie projects uh, he has in the works, and we'll go from there. But make sure you uh, follow Deborah on her social media again. I do have the links in the top comment below. And, yeah, just keep your eyes open. It hasn't been finalized yet, but my next interview should potentially be with Keith Burke, De a.k.a. Derek David from the Haves and the Have Nots. Once I have that in the books, I will let you know. And, um, you know, I'll allow people to ask questions and I will read through the questions submitted. And if there are any good ones or any questions that I am not already expected to ask, then I'll bring them up in the video like I did in this one. But with that being said, if you would like to donate to the channel, feel free to do so on PayPal, Cash App, or join Patreon for as little as $1 a month. And with that being said, thanks so much for tuning in and I'll catch you all in the next video.